All right, YouTubers, I haven't forgot about you. I'll go ahead and post a couple of videos as review for the final exam. I'm gonna go through those practice questions that we've gone through in class. It's be a great thing to watch as you're prepping for the final exam. Again, these are similar questions to what you see on the final. So that thought process that goes into it is really what it's all about. So this is from the first practice test that I made up. These are the questions that I wrote based strictly on what the study guide had to say. The study guide says you have to be able to tell the difference in size between different atoms on the periodic table. So they give you a set of atoms all in the same group or all in the same period. You'd be able to figure out which one's the largest, which one's the smallest. The two elements we key in on are francium and fluorine. As you can see in this illustration, francium is the largest atom on the periodic table. So the closer something is to francium, the larger it's going to be. Fluorine is the smallest atom on the periodic table, so the closer to fluorine it is, the smaller it's going to be. So within a period, a horizontal row, the stuff that's over here on the left is closest to francium, so it's the biggest. The stuff that's over here closest to fluorine is going to be the smallest. So the largest ones are to the left, smallest ones to the right. Within a group, the one at the top is closest to fluorine, so it's the smallest. The one closest to the bottom is closest to francium, so it's the largest. Those are the trends in atomic radius. So we have magnesium, phosphorus, sulfur, and sodium. Magnesium, phosphorus, sulfur, and sodium. And the question asks which one's the largest. Sodium is the one that's closest to francium, so it's the largest. We have to know the trends in atomic radius as well. As far as atomic radius is concerned, it's the same trend, or ion size is concerned, it's the same trend. <clears throat> francium is going to be the largest, it's down here, it's the largest ion, and fluorine is going to be the smallest one. In this case, they'll give you a set of elements. They'll either be all metals or all non-metals. They'll again be in the same period or the same group. And you're going to say which one's the largest, which one's the smallest, based on its position on the periodic table. Again, if there are three elements that are in the same group, as in my question here, beryllium, magnesium, and calcium, the one closest to the top is closest to fluorine, so it's the smallest. The one Further down is closest to francium, so it's the largest. Same exact trend you have with atomic radius. It would be the same thing if we had elements that were in the same period. So if we were talking about phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, phosphorus is closest to francium, so it's the largest. Chlorine is closest to fluorine, so it's the smallest. Same trend for both things. You have to understand that all the elements in a period have the same number of energy levels. That is the period trend. So if we're looking at potassium, calcium, cross to krypton, all these elements here in period four all have four energy levels. That's what they all have in common. If we look at lithium, beryllium, all the way over to neon, period two, all those elements have two energy levels. The group trend is valence electrons. Group 1 has 1, group 2 has 2, group 13 has 3, 14 has 4, 15 has 5, 16 has 6, 17 has 7, and 18 has 8. The group trend is valence electrons. <clears throat> the period trend is energy levels. Isotope notation, you've got to know the number on the top is the mass, and the number on the bottom is the atomic number. When asked for the number of protons, you're just looking at the number on the bottom. You're looking at the atomic number. The answer is 29. If you were ever asked for the number of neutrons, it's the top number minus the bottom number. That's all you got to know about those, those isotope symbols. There are atoms of elements that have a different number of neutrons. Again, that's not important. You just got to know what these numbers are and how to interpret that. On this one, the way that most people define an atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains all the properties of that element. That's the most commonly used definition of what an atom is. Unfortunately, that's not the definition that they chose to use 
on the district level. They chose to use the smallest unit of matter that retains the properties of matter. And that really is a confusing definition. I'm assuming by unit, they mean a collection of pieces. Because, you know, those each individual pieces, protons, neutrons, and electrons, are smaller than an atom. And even those are made up of smaller particles. So one could consider a proton a unit because it's, it's composed of two smaller particles still. Again, it's a very confusing definition, but they are choosing this definition, so we have to make sure that you know it. Smallest unit of matter that retains the properties of matter. Just, I get it's a, a bad definition, just know it. Orbital notation, <clears throat> we gotta remember that the arrows in the orbital notation represent electrons. So if a question were to ask you what element is that, all you gotta do is count the arrows. The arrows will tell you the atomic number. So you have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 13, 14 arrows there. That means atomic number 14. We look to our periodic table and that is sodium. So again, the number of arrows in the orbital notation, that tells you the number of electrons in the atom. That's gonna be the same as the atomic number because we have to assume these things are neutral unless it tells us otherwise. So that's your atomic number. And a question like this where you have to figure out what's wrong with orbital notations, a few things to keep in mind. When you're doing p orbitals, you have to put one arrow in each box first before you're allowed to double them up. So when we look at this first one here, this is incorrect. There's two arrows in that box and these other two have been left empty. Again, the rule is one arrow per box and then you can double them up. So what we see here is more correct. What we see here is what this one should look like with those two arrows separated. You've got to watch the order of orbitals, 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, 3b, and so on. And make sure that they are in that order. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. That one's correct. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. That one's correct. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s. That one's correct. 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 4s. This one is not. The order of orbitals is bad in that one. Another thing, and I didn't mention it up here, this is a, just a general electron configuration concept is that you have to fill up levels before you move on to the next one. So we can't move on to 3P until 3S has been filled completely. So that would be an error in this one. So again, what's wrong with this one is this P orbital. You can't put those two together. They would have to be separated. The problem with this one is that this orbital is not filled before we went on to the next one. The problem with this one is the order of orbitals here. They have 4s before 3p. These would have to be switched. That's the only one that is correct of those four. It's the only one that fits all those criteria. Lewis structures, the dot surveillance electrons. So this particular element has five valence electrons. And again, the group trend is valence electrons. So when you see five valence electrons, you know that this element belongs to group 15. Five valence electrons, group 15. And we're looking for the member of period three in group 15, and that would be phosphorus. This Lewis structure <clears throat> has seven dots. And again, the dots are the valence electrons. Seven dots means seven valence electrons. Seven valence electrons is telling us it's in group 17 on the periodic table. Again, group one has one, group two has two. Then we script all the way over to group 13 and we drop the ones. Group 13 has three, 14 has four, 15 has five, 16 has six, 17 has seven, 18 has eight. So seven valence electrons means group 17. Period four means row four, and that is bromine, BR. Again, make sure you know the dots are valence electrons and that um, the valence electrons are telling you what group it belongs to. This is an important idea, understanding that as electrons drop, drop between energy levels, they emit light. And the further they have to drop, the longer distance they drop, the more energy that light has to have. So if an electron drops a long distance, it has to release a large amount of energy, which means it's gonna be up at the high energy end of the electromagnetic spectrum, or the visible spectrum anyways. It's gonna be up at the violet end. 
So that's what we see here. We're going from level one or level seven all the way back down to level one again. We're going a long, long distance. Long distance means a lot of energy. A lot of energy means by the light. If we're dropping a short distance, the electron doesn't have to lose as much energy. So what we would expect to see is something on the lower energy side of the visible spectrum, and that would be red. And remember Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. It's in order from low energy to high energy. So red is the lowest energy light, violet is the highest energy light. If it falls a short distance, that's low energy, that's red. If it falls a long distance, that's high energy, that's violet. That's what you gotta remember. Which of the following combinations don't like to make a molecular compound? And I've said this several times, probably at least a dozen times over the past week. Molecular compound means that you're dealing with a covalent substance, covalent bonding. And for covalent bonding, you have to have two nonmetals. So we look through this and look for the one with two nonmetals, and that's nitrogen and bromine. Molecular compound means covalent bonding. Covalent bonding means two nonmetals. If it were to ask for something ionic, you'd be looking for something that has a metal in it. Metals do ionic bonding. Which of the following is a covalent substance? Again, same idea. You're looking for the one that's two nonmetals. That would be C. If it asked for which one was an ionic substance, then we'd be looking for metals. Covalent, all nonmetals, ionic, you gotta have a metal in it. Electron configurations when things ionize, they're gonna look like a noble gas, and that's the important piece. We gotta recognize what noble gas that element's going to resemble when it makes its ion. So metals will resemble the noble gas that comes before it on the periodic table. They lose electrons when they make their positive ions, so they drop in number. Nonmetals will gain electrons when they form their negative ions, and when they gain electrons, that means they'll resemble the noble gas that comes after it on the periodic table. So the number of electrons goes up. So we're talking about oxygen in the first question here. Oxygen is atomic number eight. That means oxygen has eight electrons. When it makes its ion, it has to gain two more electrons. Oxygen is in group 16. That means it has six valence electrons already. It needs eight. So it's going to degain two more. So instead of having eight electrons, it'll have 10. Atomic number 10 is neon. That's what it's going to resemble. So we would pick the electron configuration that has 10 electrons in it. That's what it would be. Again, Nonmetals will resemble the noble gas that comes after it. Its atomic number will go up, basically, though the protons don't change. The number of electrons will match that new atomic number. So again, oxygen starts off at eight electrons. Because it's in group 16, it needs two more. So it ends up with 10. It resembles atomic number 10. It resembles neon when it's done. For sodium, sodium is a metal. Metals have to lose their valence electrons to become stable. Sodium normally has 11. It's in group one, which means it has one valence electron. It has to lose that one electron, and when it does, it'll only have 10. So again, it'll resemble a noble gas with 10 electrons, and again, that's neon. C would be the answer here. So, as I said, it's more about understanding what noble gas it's gonna look like than anything else. That's how you find your answers in problems like this. Nomenclature, remember when it's ionic, it's got a metal in it. When it's covalent, it doesn't. So this is an ionic substance. It's got sodium in it. And when you're dealing with your ionic substances, never use prefixes. That's where they catch you all the time. That's probably why this is on the third test now in a row that they've written. A lot of mistakes made with those prefixes. If there's a metal in the formula, there's no prefix in the name. For the ionic ones, you just break it into the positive and the negative ion. The positive ion is sodium. The negative ion is nitrate, NO2. You do get that table of polyatomic ions on the final exam, so look at it. Make sure you're looking at the right thing, because I've got nitride, nitrite, and nitrate in here. You look on that table of polyatomic ions, NO2 is nitrite. So we know it's either this one or that one. No Roman numeral in this because sodium is a predictable metal. It's in group one, so the answer is B. For your covalents, well, that's where you use your prefixes. Tetra means four, so four bromine. 
There was nothing in front of the carbon, so we assume it was supposed to be mono. So this would be one carbon, four bromine. One carbon, four bromine. The answer would be C. Mono is one, di is two, tri is three, tetra is four. Penta is five, and I don't think you see anything beyond that. <clears throat> Again, no prefixes if you have a metal. Prefixes mean covalent. Lewis structure question, what's the correct Lewis structure for HCl? I've given to this problem to you on a uh, quiz. I've given this problem to you on a test. I think this problem was on the uh, third quarter exam as well. All of these have HCl in it. The question is which one's right. And which one's right is the one that has the correct number of electrons around each atom. Hydrogen is only allowed to have two electrons. The dash counts as two electrons. So this is showing hydrogen with four. So we know that one's not right. Again, the dash represents two electrons. That is showing hydrogen with four. So we know that's not right. This one again, same problem. Two, four, that's showing hydrogen with four electrons. That's not right. That's the only one that shows the correct number of electrons on the hydrogen. So that's gotta be the right answer. Hydrogen has to have two, chlorine has to have eight. That one only shows chlorine with two. That one only shows chlorine with four. That one shows it with eight, but again, the hydrogen's the issue there. That one shows the chlorine with eight. It's gotta be two on the hydrogen, eight on the chlorine, the answer is D. Shapes, Vespert, you gotta just know that. Two atom molecules are always linear. Five atom mo molecules are always tetrahedral. So those are the easy ones. If you see one of these structures and you count two atoms in it, you know it's linear, you don't have to think anything more about it. If you see one of these structures and you see five in there, tetrahedral, you don't have to think anything more about it. It's only with the three and four atom molecules that we have to worry, because there's two different shapes. Three can be linear or bent. Four can be trigonal, planar, or pyramidal. So again, it's a matter of trying to figure out what's going on with these pairs of electrons. We're only looking at the middle atom when we do this, the one that everything else is connected to. And we're looking to see if we have a pair of dots on it. This is a four atom molecule, one, two, three, four. The middle atom has a pair of dots on it. Four atoms with a pair of dots would be pyramidal. So the answer for that one. Again, if they keep it simple on the final, it'll either be a two atom or a five atom. Two atom structures are linear, five atom structures are tetrahedral. If they want to make it tricky, they do three and four. I don't think they're going to make it tricky. This is a polarity thing, and um, this is a simple polar molecule. Uh, they make these more complicated on the, the final, then this is going to be a real pain to answer. Here's what you got to know. This is what works well in class when you're given electronegativities, but there are no electronegativities on the reference sheet, which means you can't really use that as your reference. So forget it. Learn this. Hydrogen oxygen bonds are polar. Hydrogen fluorine bonds are polar. Hydrogen nitrogen bonds are polar. So when you're looking at a structural formula, if you see one of those bonds, then the bond is polar. And if you can separate the charge with a straight line, put all the positives on one side, all the negatives on the other, then it's a polar molecule. And if it's polar, it dissolves in water. So let's take a look at the one we've got up here. We've got a hydrogen-fluorine bond, and again, hydrogen-fluorine bonds are one of the three that are always polar bonds. The hydrogen's always gonna be the positive one of those bonds, so it's positive, that's negative, you can split it with a straight line, that is a polar molecule. And because it's a polar molecule, it will dissolve in a polar solvent like water. Hydrogen carbon bonds are not polar. I tell you that because there's a whole class of compounds called organic compounds. And organic compounds have pretty complicated structures. And there's a lot of carbons and hydrogens in those structures. And what I'm telling you here is you can ignore all those carbon-hydrogen bonds. Because carbon-hydrogen bonds are not polar bonds, we don't have to consider those in our polarity all we have to consider are the hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, chlorine, and hydrogen, nitrogen bonds that are in those molecules. 
Molecular and empirical formulas. Molecular formulas are for covalent substances. They are always covalent substances. There can't be any metals in a molecular formula. Empirical means reduced. It's in its lowest terms that subscripts have been reduced. It does not mean ionic, even though those are the formulas we always use for ionic compounds. Molecular means covalent, empirical only means reduced. So this is asking which one is a molecular formula. It's asking which one is covalent. That means two nonmetals. The answer is B. This one is asking which one is an empirical formula. And again, that is only asking you which one is reduced. Two and six can be reduced. It's not A. Two and two could be reduced. It's not B. Three and one. There's your reduced one. That can't be reduced any further. So C is your empirical formula. This one does happen to be ionic, but again, they don't have to be ionic. Our answer for the first question here, that molecular formula, CCL4, is also an empirical formula. So empirical applies to both types of compounds, ionic and covalent. Empirical only means reduced in its lowest terms. Molecular means covalent. Percent composition by mass. This is where we have to do the molar mass of the substance, and then we have to plug it into the equation for percent, part divided by whole times 100. The part is the mass of the element. The whole is the molar mass. Again, we multiply it by 100. So we have NaPO4. The first thing we have to do is find the molar mass. There's one sodium times 23. This is 23. There's one phosphorus times 31 is 31. There's four oxygens times 16 is 64. And then we add all three of those together. 23 plus 31 plus 64 is 118. That's the molar mass. Now we're asked to do the percent mass for sodium. So the number we use on top is sodiums. It's 23 over the molar mass, 118 times 100. And that's 19%. So the answer is C. Again, we do the same thing here with the second one. We're doing methane this time, CH4. The process starts with calculating the molar mass. CH4 has one carbon times 12 it is 12. It has four hydrogens times one is four. Add those together, you get 16. It's asking for the percent composition of carbon. So we use carbon's number on top, that's 12, divided by the molar mass, 16, times 100 is 75%, which would be D. Again, the part divided by whole times 100, the part is whatever that element contributes. The whole is the molar mass times 100. You need to know that the stronger the intermolecular forces a substance has, the higher its boiling point is going to be. I mean, you don't even have to know this stuff. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest. Dipole-dipole attractions in the middle. Dispersion forces are the weakest. So hydrogen bonding would have the highest boiling point. Dispersion, the lowest. You don't even have to know that much. Just know that the stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point is going to be. So because this is the strongest one, it would have the highest boiling point. The stronger the intermolecular force, the higher the boiling point of the substance. You need to know that temperature is a measurement of average kinetic energy that indicates how fast the particles are moving in matter. So when something is hot, that simply means the particles are moving very fast. When something is cold, that means the particles are moving very slow. So when water is heated up, getting hotter and hotter, the particles will be moving faster and faster. If you were to cool water down, the particles would move slower and slower. Simple as that. State changes, whether they're endothermic or exothermic, depends on what state you're changing between. Here we're going from a liquid to a gas. Solid, liquid, gas is in order from the lowest energy to the highest energy. Okay. 
We are going from liquid to gas. We are going from here to there. We are going from low to high. We are going from a lower energy state to a higher energy state. And whenever you're going from a lower energy state to a higher energy state, you're going to have to add energy to it. And if you add energy to it, it is an endothermic phase change. If we had gone the other direction, from gas to liquid, we'd be going from high to low, we'd have to remove energy from it, and then it would be exothermic. You've got to be able to interpret your heating graphs, heating curves. In particular, you have to pay attention to the state changes. B is where it melts, D is where it boils. Where the lines are flat, that's where the phase changes are happening. The first phase change you come to is melting. The second phase change you come to is boiling. While a substance changes state, the temperature stays constant. That's why the line is flat. So while it's melting, the temperature stays a constant negative 60 in this graph. While it's boiling, the temperature stays a constant positive 60 in this graph. Because the temperature is not changing, the kinetic energy is not changing. Again, when we looked at it in class, we talked a lot about potential energy in that point in the graph. That's not the way they want you to look at it. They want you to understand that temperature is kinetic energy. And since the kinetic energy, or since the temperature is not changing at B and D, temperature is constant here, temperature is constant there, you need to know that the kinetic energy is also constant at those points. I know gas law, uh, I've got gas law videos up there and looking at the clock here and I'm thinking, I want to get through all of these before a physics class comes in this morning. Again, ideal gas law, you're going to get the equation PV equals nRT. You'll know it's an ideal gas law problem because you only have one of each variable. There'll only be one pressure, there'll only be one temperature, etc. So in this one, we only have one volume, we only have one pressure, we only have one temperature. That's your indication that this is an uh, ideal gas law problem. R will be given to you on the reference sheet, so you don't have to memorize that either. It's just substitute and solve. Make sure you know this. Whenever you have liters, you know that's V. Wherever you have atmospheres, you know that's P. Wherever you have Kelvin, you know it's T. Wherever you have moles, you know it's N. So uh, identify your variables. Take the time to do that. Slow down to do that. And, um, and then use your algebra skills to solve. Again, I have a whole video on the gas laws, so go back and watch that if you want to review how to work the gas law problems. Uh, you need to know how solubility is affected by temperature and pressure. For temperature, it affects both a solid and a gas, but it affects them in opposite ways. For the solid, increasing the temperature generally increases the solubility. That's why you add sugar to tea when it's hot. You can dissolve more. The higher temperature means you have a higher solubility. For gases, it's the other way around. For gases, the solubility decreases as the temperature goes up. This is why you see a lot of dead fish around the lakes in the summertime. As the water temperature goes up, the dissolved oxygen goes down and fish suffocate. Pressure only affects gases. So increasing or decreasing pressure would do nothing to a solid but it will change the gas. Increasing pressure will increase the solubility of the gas. This is what they do with soda cans. They put a high pressure of carbon dioxide in the can. That increases the solubility of carbon dioxide and puts more of it in the liquid. Then when you pop the can open, the pressure drops. So the solubility drops and all that carbon dioxide starts bubbling out. That's how they make fizzy drinks. Again, the other gas laws, just remember, You'll know it's one of the other gas laws if there's duplicates of anything. Like in this one here, I have two things that are in atmospheres. I have two pressures. If I have two pressures, I know it's one of the other gas laws. And this is pressure, that is volume, so I would use the equation that has pressures and volumes in it. This one here has two temperatures, 290 Kelvin, 225 Kelvin. I've got a duplicate on temperature, so I know it's one of the other gas laws. It's not the ideal gas law. It's temperature and volume, so I pick the equation that has temperature and volume in it. Watch your ones and twos, read the, the questions carefully to figure that part out. Again, what's most important is you keep the linked numbers together. 0.75 liters at 290 Kelvin. You know those have to go on the same side of the equal sign. It doesn't really matter which side they're on, they just have to be on the same side of the equal sign. 
2.5 liters at 1.5 atmospheres, means those are linked together. They have to be on the same side of the equal sign. It really doesn't matter which side it is, though. Again, if you need more review on the gas laws, go watch my gas law video. As far as this is concerned, it says in the study guide, you're going to have pictures of balloons. So I searched the internet, found some pictures of balloons. This is its original size, and these are our three options, smaller, same, or larger. If we were to cool down a balloon, decrease its temperature, that would decrease its volume. That's Charles Law. So if we take this balloon and cool it down, we would expect it to look like A. We would expect it to get smaller. If we were to heat that balloon up, it would get bigger, and it would look like C. We also have to know the pressure thing, too how the pressure would change it. If we were to increase the pressure inside this balloon, it would look like C, it would get bigger. If we were to decrease the pressure in that balloon, it would look like A. The two concepts are really very much interrelated to one another. It's really kind of a combined gas law idea more than anything else. But do make sure you understand that. If you're gonna change the temperature of a balloon, heating it up would make it bigger, cooling it down would make it smaller. If you were to change the pressure inside that balloon, increasing the pressure would make it bigger, decreasing the pressure would make it smaller. They have kind of common sense stuff there, but it does say in the study guide there are pictures of balloons. All right, dissociation versus solvation is the concept here. You've got to understand it's ionic compounds that dissociate. An ionic compound means it has a metal in it. So when a question says which of the following would dissociate in water, it's just asking you which one's ionic. So you're looking for the one that has the metal in it, and that would be C. Again, dissociate means ionic. Ionic means it's the one with the metal. Molarity calculations, and it does say in the study guide, they're going to give you the molar mass. So expect to get the grams of solute, expect to get the molar mass, and expect to get the liters of solution. Now that makes it simple. All you've got to do is take the grams of the solute, the 55 grams, divide it by the molar mass, 40, and then take that answer and divide it by the liters that you have. So again, when you're doing the molarity questions like this, where they give you the mass of the solute, where they give you the molar mass, where they give you the liters of solution, it's simple. We would do 55, the grams that they gave us, divided by the molar mass of 40, that's 1.375. Take that number and divide it by 0.75 liters of solution, and we've got our answer. 1.8 molar. Again, grams of solute divided by molar mass divided by liters of solution. It's all division, all the way through. Acids under the Uranius definition is H something, base is something OH. <clears throat> so where it asks for the Uranius acid is H something, that would be B got to be H and then some negative ion to be an acid. Anything OH like this, that's base. It says in the study guide you have to be able to use particle diagrams to identify strong and weak acids and bases. Strong means dissociates completely. Strong means it breaks down into ions completely. So if that's what the acid looks like, the blue dot with the black dot attached to it, and it's strong, it's the one that has none of those left. All of them have broken down. All of them have separated into their component ions. That's what strong means. All of these would be weak because you can see we still have acid left in all of those. You got to know the properties of acids and bases, and specifically these are the properties. You got to know acids have a pH of less than 7. They taste sour, and litmus paper ends up red. Blue turns red. Red stays red. Bases have a pH greater than 7, they are bitter, and the litmus paper ends up blue. Blue stays blue, red turns blue. So if I know the pH is 2, I know it's an acid, which means it's going to taste sour, and the blue litmus paper is going to turn red. If I see that it's bitter, I know that's a base, and so the pH is greater than 7, and I know the red litmus paper is going to turn blue. You know those properties. Neutralization is an acid reacting with a base, something that starts with H reacting with something that ends with OH. That's neutralization. And when they neutralize, they make a salt and water. That's obviously the water. The leftover ions are the salts. 
This is my acid, H something. This is my base, something OH. Conjugate acid-base pairs, they have the same negative ions. They look a lot alike, first thing to remember. The acid has one more hydrogen than the base. So we're looking at SO4 here. So we know A and B are our only answer choices because they have to look like SO4. Okay? These are the only two that look like SO4. They have SO4 in it. The one with the hydrogen on it is going to be the acid. That one's going to be the base. So the answer is A, or answer B. This is the conjugate base to that. Again, the base has the less hydrogen. The acid has one more. The conjugate acid for NH3 would have one more hydrogen in it. It would be NH4. Again, the acid has one more hydrogen than the base does. They look an awful lot alike. That's what you've got to keep in mind. You gotta be able to identify those three reaction types and only those three reaction types. Synthesis has no plus sign on the product side. Decomposition has no plus sign on the reactant side. Single replacement has plus signs on both sides. So no plus sign on the reactant side, that is decomposition. Plus signs on both sides, that is single replacement. Should be some easy points to get there. Got to be able to use a solubility table. Again, it's just important to recognize if you see an S on the solubility table, that does not mean solid. S means soluble. That means it will dissolve in water, and the state is AQ. If you see an I on the solubility table, that means insoluble. That means it does not dissolve in water, so your state is S. I mean, that's the important thing to remember. You find your positive ion, you find your negative ion, you see where they intercept, and you see what letter's there. If it says S there, the state is AQ. If it says I there, the state is solid. A solid is called a precipitate if it's on the product side. So don't be confused if a question asks you for a precipitate. They're just asking you which one would be solid on the product side. So you're looking for the one that has an I in it when it's on the solubility table. This one's conservation of matter. Conservation of matter, conservation of mass says that matter can't be created or destroyed. The mass of the reactants has to be the same as the mass of the products. That simply means you have to have the same thing on this side and this side. So this is not conservation of matter because over here we have six of the white circles, but we only have two on the product side. That's destruction of matter. This one's not good because we have three blacks over here, but only two on that side. Destroying matter again. And in this one, we have three white circles over here on the reactant side, but four on the product side. We're creating matter there, so that doesn't work. The answer is this one. Three white ones, three white ones, three black ones, three black ones. Again, in the study guide, it says you have to be able to use a particle diagram to recognize conservation of matter. I searched the internet. That's the best one I found for a multiple choice question. Uh, stoichiometry, go watch my video on it. Mole ratio problems, that's the key. Make sure you can do mole ratio problems. <coughs> Avogadro's number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Make sure you memorize it. It is not on the reference sheet. That is the number of atoms or molecules in one mole of a substance. This important concept, the higher the concentration of your reactants, the faster the reaction will take place. So if you have a lot of oxygen around, the iron would rust faster. If you had less oxygen around, the iron would rust slower. This might be vacuum seal stuff. It be vacuum seal stuff to reduce the concentration of oxygen and slow down the oxidation process. The answer to this one would be if you increase the amount of oxygen, that would increase the reaction rate. That is an exothermic reaction. We know it's exothermic because it's downhill. It's a downhill reaction, it's exothermic, you're going from high energy reactants to low energy products. If it were an uphill reaction, then it would be endothermic. So again, look to see which direction you're going. If you're going downhill, it's exo. If you were going uphill, it's endo. Energy, kilojoules, is on the reactant side. When it's on the reactant side, it is an endothermic reaction. If the energy had been on the product side, it would be exothermic. And that is it.
such a late because we only have a few minutes before business gets here. I'm going to do another video today uh, during my second period planning, going through the second practice test, the one I made for the test banks that I have. Same kind of idea. So you can sit there with your test, go back through it, look at questions, answer them, pause the video, watch the video, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, just so you have lots of resources available so you can ace this final.